Thanks, everybody. Um, so this will be a soft content lecture about taking care of old people with HIV. <laughs> um, there is less board applicable material here, except for a few things that might be related to management of osteoporosis and maybe neurocognitive stuff. Um, as a um, vouching for my credentials, I have treated HIV people for a while, and I also was part of a national grant about expanding geriatric access nationwide. Put those together, and it is HIV and geriatrics. <laughs> All right. When you say old people, are talking like 40? Well, it is an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> when, when, <laughs> when, when we look at the data here, some of it will talk about people that are older than 50. <laughs> and some of it will talk about people that are older than 50. Um, and some will talk about people that are actually old, like 65. All right. So um, what has changed about HIV since the beginning of the pandemic? The pandemic the HIV pandemic, not the COVID pandemic, is that medications have helped people to live longer. People don't die as early. That's good news. What it has meant is the things we're managing for at least half of our HIV patients are now diseases of aging that are complicated and made more difficult to manage because they occur concurrently with HIV. So, Many of us who went into HIV care were dealing with young, urban, um, newly infected individuals who were 20 or 30. Now we're dealing with long term infected individuals who are 50, 60. Um, Pooja takes care of just like 80 year olds. Her clinic is just, <laughs> is just a geriatric HIV clinic interspersed with some young people. Um, right? <laughs> like, if she said, hey, this patient's 35, I'll go and look at the demographic box and say, no, wait, you're wrong. Um, people with chronic HIV get more comorbid conditions, and those comorbid conditions happen sometimes earlier. And no matter what, with increased frequency in HIV infected individuals compared to others. Um, what we're trying to do with our older HIV patients is to manage their HIV but not ignore the other comorbid conditions. So overall, we're improving their quality of life. And the reason that that's important for us as ID providers is despite what you might see in a nice coordinated setting like the VA, where there is primary care, infectious disease, and everything else, for many of you, if you go into private practice, you may be the primary care provider for your elderly HIV patients. And so, no one else is going to do the rest of this management because they'll say, wait, you have HIV and any other disease. I don't know what to do. You better go and talk to your infectious disease doctor. So you'll be the one that has to make those decisions. Um, this, I think, is some interesting data. This is um, a collection of the people living with HIV um, total diagnoses in the US by age cohort. We've now reached the point, and this is as of 2018, where more than half of the individuals who are HIV positive are 50 and above. Um, some of this is old infections as people get older, but there's still several thousand newly diagnosed individuals in this older age cohort. If you look at those other bars, the 40 to 49 year olds, you see that there's going to be over the next decade, many more individuals moving into the older cohort. So um, HIV is now going to be a disease of older individuals rather than a disease of younger individuals primarily. Um, it is still primarily for new diagnoses, a infection of younger individuals. So if you look at new diagnoses, peak of those still occur in the 20s into the 30s. But look at the other side of that graph. We're still doing new diagnoses for people 50, 55, even above 65. Um, you all are aware of the fact that people over 50 
may still engage in risk behaviors that could lead to HIV acquisition. Um, that means you still have to ask your patients, are there risk behaviors that require testing? Remember, CDC wants us to test everyone for HIV up to age 64 as part of screening. That is absent of any risk factors. People are still engaging in risk behavior, whether that be unprotected sex, IV drug use, et cetera. Their risk is ongoing and they could still be at risk for a new infection. Um, remember that we live close to the villages. Yeah, it's much here. And um, <laughs> people love to drive their cool golf carts around and go to whatever parties might exist. Um, who knows what they're doing? What I try to imagine is um, there's we understand like boomers who are still doing what was cool for them as boomers. We're like, oh, look at what those old people are doing. <laughs> what I don't know is what retired Gen Xers will look like that will be ridiculous to younger generations while we still think it's really cool. Like, are we going to be driving golf carts listening to like Snoop Dogg and stuff? <laughs> oh my God, you guys are horrible. Um, it's a worry on my part. And uh, you guys, I'm tasking you to let us know, hey, that's lame. <laughs> because we won't recognize it ourselves. Thank you. It's not lame. Dr. Kennedy says it's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the concepts we talk about when we talk about the um, additive effects of HIV and chronic diseases is a notion of either accelerated disease or a accentuated disease. The idea of accelerated disease is that in the HIV population cohort, chronic diseases happen sooner than you might otherwise expect them in the um, general population. That was especially true in the early antiretroviral era or when people were less exposed to antiretroviral therapy. Kidney disease, diabetes, heart disease, cancers occurred earlier than would be expected. In the antiretroviral area, era, we tend to see accentuated disease where at the same age level, more disease still occurs than in the general population. That's revealed in this graph. This is a theoretical graph, not a data-based graph. So the red line represents the HIV population and general disease frequency of other comorbid conditions. You would see in that population that disease frequency occurring earlier than the general population and at higher levels. So those are the other things you need to expect in your HIV patients. Um, we have been very good with the promise that if you take your antiretrovirals, you will live a life similar in life expectancy to age-matched cohorts without HIV. But for that to occur, it requires management of everything in that area above the blue curve. So this is not an antibiotic buying gram, um, but that's the area <laughs> under the curve that you're interested in. Um, have you guys heard us talk about CD4 counts and older people? Do older people have better CD4 counts than younger people, or generally lower CD4 counts than younger people? Lower, you're right. So this, the immune system is weaker in general. It is also weaker in our older HIV patients. Has a few consequences. It can mean that a newly diagnosed older person will manifest with AIDS-related complications sooner after initial infection than a younger person. That's consequence one. Consequence two is with therapy, the likelihood of a more robust immune restoration is less than for a younger individual. So if we treat a 35 year old with antiretrovirals and they start with a CD4 count of 350, we may expect them to get back up to 500, 800, et cetera. If you're newly diagnosed at 60 or 55 and your Nader CD4 count is around 250, you may only get to 350. A increase of 100 cells or more is less likely in older individuals starting at a lower CD4 nadir. So that tells us that we have to be 
rigorous with encouraging adherence to get the best outcomes we can for those patients, and also tells us as much as we can do to diagnose people earlier by monitoring risk factors and testing frequently, we can hopefully have better immune restoration. Um, that's revealed a little bit in this slide. This is the percent of people at time of new diagnosis that present with an AIDS diagnosis. So if you are initially diagnosed with HIV at an age of 55 or above, a third of those patients are presenting with AIDS as their diagnosis, either by CD4 um, total count, CD4 percentage, or the presence of an AIDS-defining illness. It is less likely as you go down the other age cohorts. And this can be for a number of reasons. Um, among those older individuals, that could be longer term infection that went unrecognized because they haven't sought testing, et cetera. Additionally, adding to that is the lower CD4 count that they could have by age alone. That is increasing their risk for AIDS related complication. Um, so with all that being said, um, one thing that is different for our older patients is that if we do population estimates of who has HIV, either recognized or unrecognized, most people in the older age cohort who have HIV have been diagnosed with it. Um, it's a little bit of a weird theoretical concept. So 10% of people over 55 have HIV and don't know it. 90% of those with HIV are aware of their diagnosis. And if you think about it further, it can sound both complex and also super dumb. Obviously, as people get older, more time has passed where they could be diagnosed and more and more people are aware. Um, it's revealed in the same way here. If we look at the country overall, we estimate that about 86% of people who are HIV infected have been tested and are aware of their diagnosis. That's different from age group to age group. By the time you get to 55 plus, it's 94 or 95% who are aware of their diagnosis and can manage it from there. Remember, those other bars and those younger age groups, if we can close those gaps and diagnose them earlier, again, we're going to have better Nader CD4 counts, better chances of recovery, and for most of the comorbid chronic diseases we're talking about, strength of the immune system and CD4 count tend to also be surrogate markers of the likelihood of manifestations of renal disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. When you treat your old HIV patients, do you use the DHHS guidelines for adults and adolescents? Or do you use the DHHS guidelines for old people? No, there are no DHHS guidelines for old people. There are, there are only DHHS guidelines for adults and adolescents. Um, and luckily, Old people still fall into a category that we call adults. Um, so if you were to ask yourself, what is the best initial therapy of an old person with HIV? Your answer would be. Great. So. These are the things that affect our antiretroviral choices in older patients. Um, we need to remember that we want to get them on therapy to avoid accelerating or attenuating chronic diseases. Remember, all of those people on their golf carts are at risk of transmitting HIV if they are undiagnosed. The idea of undetectable equals untransmittable means we also need to treat old people with HIV. And importantly, um, way back when we were trying to decide, do we need to start people on antiretroviral therapy early or do we need to wait later, which was a question about 10 years ago. We used to know, not know whether the comorbid conditions with HIV were drug related or whether they were disease related. Mm -hmm. The SMART trial answered the question to say, 
people's emergence of cardiovascular renal hepatic events with HIV are related more to the HIV than to medication-related side effects. So starting people earlier on therapy and starting elderly patients or older patients as soon as we can decreases their risk for the emergence of other comorbid conditions. When we look, just like we talked about awareness of a diagnosis, um, this is a chart that looks at the same thing, but among the entire cohort of HIV infected individuals, how many of them are virally suppressed, engaged in care, um, or aware of their diagnosis? And so you see, as people get older, they are more likely to be engaged in care. They are more likely as a population to have viral suppression. Um, conceptually, again, this makes sense. If you don't even know you're diagnosed, your viral load is unlikely to be suppressed. Mm -hmm. If you are aware of your diagnosis, you're more likely to be engaged in care or likely to be on therapy. But it is interesting, even with 94% awareness of a diagnosis in the older cohort, we generally have achieved virologic suppression in only 60% of those patients. So those are the gaps we're trying to close. Have you guys ever taken care of a patient who's on more medication than Big Tarvi? <laughs> you have. Wait, we just said the only one we know is Big Tarvi. So, um, in the in CPRS, there's like all these medications, and rarely is there just one bar. There's all these bars. Um, that is polypharmacy. Are HIV patients more likely to be um, at risk for polypharmacy or less likely? More, more. You got it right again. Um, so again, on the on your boards, very frequently they have yes no questions like that. Um, so you're ready for that as well. No, Shana says I'm completely wrong. There are <laughs> there are no questions that ask you that. Um, but remember. Um, once we're dealing with patients in the older population, 57 to 85 year old, on average, half of those patients are on at least five medications. One in 20 have a major drug drug interaction. Are HIV medications in a low drug interaction potential category or a high drug interaction potential category? High, right? So polypharmacy in our HIV patients is a bigger risk for us. Um, when people are on multiple agents, we have a lot of things we have to worry about. Included in that can be adherence with their medications. Um, we have one in the list that we usually are very interested in adherence with. Um, however, patients may elect with multiple medications to stop taking our HIV medications. Maybe they'll stop taking anticoagulant medications after a, a stroke or a, a PE or DBT. They may elect to stop taking blood pressure medicines, et cetera. And when they do, we may have exacerbation of comorbid conditions. Polypharmacy puts us at risk for drug interactions, and it puts us at risk for additive side effects. Um, have you ever had a patient who has renal dysfunction? when you're treating their HIV? Have you ever had a patient who has hepatic dysfunction when you're treating their HIV? At the VA, no. No, you never have because we are awesome. You've never allowed it to occur. However, in, in all of these other clinics, who knows what's going on? Um, when you, if you went to Hippocrates and looked at the medications on someone's list, are there other medications that can cause renal dysfunction? Are there medications that can cause hepatic dysfunction? Is it hard to figure out what you're supposed to do with the antiretrovirals because is it this medication or is it something else? What do we usually blame? Everything else. We blame everything else. It's not ours, ours is essential, it's probably something else. But we need to be aware of those potentials that the medications we're giving are causing problems or others do. And as we were talking about Dr. Horn, establishing his relationships with other providers, establishing his practice. In these patients who have multiple comorbid conditions, 
sometimes we're not going to be the one who feels comfortable making a decision about which medication is essential or not. And so you need to collaborate with the whole team to figure out, hey, I'm concerned about this. Is there another option for you? Is there another option for us that can mitigate those risks? Have you guys ever tried to de-prescribe medications for a patient? Looks easy, right? Here's, this is a simplified algorithm for how to consider whether you should stop a medication for a patient. Have you ever gone through this systematically? Mm -hmm. What do you think are important steps in deciding whether you should continue a medication or stop a medication? What are the easiest medications to stop? Statins. <laughs> well, you're you're too specific, so I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a different choice. Um, if you have a medication whose efficacy and necessity is backed by evidence-based medicine versus a medication that there is no evidence of efficacy, which one is more likely to be eligible to be stopped? The no evidence. The no evidence one, right. So a first step in simplifying medications is to get rid of medications that don't have a proven benefit for a patient. Um, among those could be things that never had a proven benefit, but also it is important to look for medications that may have previously been thought to have a benefit and no longer do because of evolving evidence. We do that even with some of our OI prophylaxis now. So when we're dealing with trimethoprim sulfa prophylaxis in a patient, um, we used to hold very steady to do not stop it if the CD4 count is 199 or the percentage is less than um, 18 or 19. Um, there are many practices that will say if you have a virally suppressed individual and you're having any concerns about toxicity related to their trimethoprim sulfa, you can stop it unless their CP4 counts less than 100. So those are factors you would put into these sort of decision making processes. Um, you stop medications if they're causing a patient obvious side effects and you can mitigate those side effects by changing to another regimen. And the other thing that's important, especially when you're dealing with older individuals, is to have consultation with them about what are their treatment goals and what are we trying to do with each of these medications. There may be preventive medications that they don't want to take anymore. There may be risk factor modifiers related to cardiovascular risk, et cetera, where they've fallen out of an age range to get a primary benefit anymore. All of those are considerations that you can make. And sometimes you're going to be doing those in conjunction with someone else. And then another easy thing we can do, if you have a medication that can be given at a variety of doses and maybe a metabolic side effect has emerged, are you able to get the same efficacy you need at a lower dose? And then maybe you can just try a dose reduction. So here's the exciting part. Older people also have all this other garbage going on. And among the things that could be happening with them are frailty. You guys know what frailty is? What, what is frailty? I would like you to put it um, um, awkwardly. I don't know, they break easily. Great, all right. So. That's good, and we'll talk about a little bit more of the details of that. Um, older individuals, more frail. Frailty includes breaking easily across a number of realms. Uh, HIV patients also have higher risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, renal disease. Do we ever look at their creatinine when we're taking care of patients? Um, does our pharmacist ever talk to you about like their renal function? So you always talk so we always let you know, right? Um, osteoporosis. Um, have you guys heard of osteoporosis? Do you guys manage a lot of osteoporosis? Yeah. No. Do you know how to manage osteoporosis? Yes, I did. You did? You did? Oh, no. Um, do you know how to screen for osteoporosis? Yeah. Do you know if there are specific guidelines for screening for osteoporosis in HIV patients that are different than the general population? Oh, yes. All right. So the the vote there is 
yes and I don't think so. <laughs> Someone's right. Um, do HIV patients ever have neurocognitive deficits? Mm -hmm. um, are those more frequent in the antiretroviral era or less frequent? Significantly less frequent. So one of the big neurocognitive problems in early the early HIV epidemic was AIDS dementia complex and minor cognitive deficits. With antiretroviral therapy, much of that has primarily gone away. However, um, what's the topic of this lecture? Old people. Oh, oh my gosh, that's right. Um, so sometimes old people, sometimes old people get cognitive deficits and they can't remember what's going on and they have to ask for words like, what am I talking about? Um, so older individuals still can get neurocognitive decline and we need to figure out how to recognize that and manage it as well, as well as looking for other causes that could be HIV related or other. And then the final thing that can complicate our care is malignancy. Um, over there is a cancer hospital. Uh, but surprisingly, even outside of Moffitt, people can get cancer. Um, and in HIV, what are the cancers that we think about? CNS lymphoma. Okay. Lymphoma, primary CNS lymphoma, and you just said lymphoma. Okay. Okay. Kaposi sarcoma. Okay. Great. Are those the most common cancers that we're dealing with in our HIV population? No. The most common cancers we're dealing with in our HIV population are the cancers they are at risk for because of their age or risk behaviors. And in age matched controls with the same risk factors, those cancers emerge in HIV patients at a higher frequency um, because. I heard it the immune system plays a role in regulating their mm. cancer. Has anyone heard that? Yes. OK, it's true. And so because of that, if we weaken the immune system, we also weaken the ability to regulate for early cancer emergence among all types of cancers. Um, do HIV patients smoke more than the general population? Yes. Thanks. Yes, about twofold higher risk of being tobacco users than the general population. So any tobacco or cigarette related cancer is also going to be at higher risk in those patients. Oh. I think you may have uh, answered this, but I missed it. But do like colon cancer and breast cancer, like the age-related cancers, yeah. do those appear earlier in HIV? They typically occur at the same age, but at higher levels. So they would be the attenuated risks rather than accelerated risks. All right, so Gerard, here's frailty. This is the actual <laughs> definition. Oh, okay. um, so. Um, the, the medical definition of a frail patient is someone who meets any of three of these five criteria. They either have had unintentional weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, low energy expenditure, weak grip strength, or slow gait and speed. So all of us are two of these at all times. And so all you have to do is get older and have one more emerge and you're frail, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, in our HIV patients, things that put people at risk for frailty at an increased rate are if they've been HIV infected for a long time, if they have a low CD4 count either now or at the beginning of their um, infection, if they are un if they have viremia still, all of those increase the risk for those levels of decline. Patients who either have a very high or low BMI are at risk for frailty. People co-infected with hepatitis, people with concurrent diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, and anyone on longer duration of antiretroviral therapy. All of those things together contribute to frailty for a bunch of different comorbid conditions. When a patient is more frail, their chance of medical decline increases, their chance of needing additional help either through home health assisted living, et cetera, increases. So those are the things that we're watching out for. Um, do you ever assess the nutritional status of your HIV patients? 
Pooja does. <laughs> <laughs> Gerard looked like. Um, yeah, hers are super old, right? She's she makes sandwiches for them. <laughs> so, um, the nutritional status of your patients is an important thing to assess, especially in HIV, because nutritional status can be more compromised. Um, we in the pre-heart era, we had a lot of what we would call AIDS wasting syndrome usually defined as a BMI less than like 18.5. That was AIDS related alone, but when you have uncontrolled HIV in addition with an aging population, those things can magnify as well. The best way to have a good assessment of a patient's nutritional status is to have a dietitian or a nutritionist do a formal assessment. Um, the things that we do mostly are just look at their BMI, see if it's low and say, hey, maybe you should eat some more food. Um, Great. Um, however, if you want to really assess someone carefully, um, there are some tools that you can do a formal scoring of, assess their nutritional status, and decide are they at risk for significant medical decline or are they stable? Um, there's something called a mini nutritional assessment score. There's a little form you can do that looks at demographics of your patient, and it can tell you whether this patient's fine needs more monitoring of their weight, or needs aggressive dietary intervention like nutritional supplements, et cetera. Um, this chart here helps to talk you through that if you are curious. Um, you can go to um, the internet, which was invented recently, um, and look up MNA, the mini nutritional assessment, and you'll get a score sheet that you can use. Remember, if your patients are malnourished, and they have a acute decline. They're going to stay in the hospital longer. They will have more complications related to that hospital stay. They're more at risk for dying and more at risk if they were what we call a free living old person of becoming someone who requires assisted living or nursing home care. Range. So among your free range options, there are free range chickens from which you can get free range eggs. And what you also want to encourage is free range elderly. And you can do that through these management strategies. Um, remember we talked about like um, mobility as a thing that you can lose as you get more frail. Um, here is a evidence-based test to assess a patient's mobility. It is called the timed up and go test. What do you think are the components of the timed up and go test? A chair and get up in the chair. Get back. Exactly. You time someone getting up and going. <laughs> and so they sit down in a chair that it's not a rolly chair, or else they'll just you know, the injuries, blood, you know, it's an emergency. But they sit down, they get up, you time them walking 10 feet away and back. And if they can do that in less than 12 seconds, they have good mobility. If it takes them more than 12 seconds, they are up decreased mobility, increased risk for falls, increased risk for decline. Um, does that make sense? Um, who are we most worried about having an increased risk for falls? Old people, right? <laughs> Especially old people that might have bone disorders at risk for fragility fractures. Um, who could be at risk for that? Old people? HIV-infected patients? HIV-infected patients who are also old people? Yes. So we need to make sure that they are safe when they're ambulating to avoid those sort of injuries. Do we see cardiovascular disease with increased frequency in our HIV patients? Yes. We do. A VA study was one that really identified this specifically. And what we found in that is that in addition to um, HIV effects, like metabolic alterations related to their antiretrovirals, patients had increased risk of traditional risk factors, including, for example, more smoking than the general population, more rates of obesity, more rates of dyslipidemia. Also within the study, there was speculation based on those rates controlling for everything else that chronic inflammation related to chronic HIV infection was a contributor to this disease. Now, 
you should always remember the chronic inflammation hypothesis related to HIV as it manifests for a number of conditions. Because of chronic inflammation, HIV patients are more at risk for a variety of vascular phenomena. That includes worsening renal dysfunction, worsening cardiac function, increased risk of thromboembolic events, because all of those pro-inflammatory conditions are exacerbated by the chronic inflammation of a chronic HIV infection. Here is a graph that demonstrates that people with HIV represented in blue have more acute MIs than people in green without HIV. Is this an understandable bar graph to you? The blue bars are taller. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what it shows. I know how to interpret <laughs> graphs. Um, dementia is a thing you're going to see in your HIV patients. Um, how do you guys assess for dementia? Do you or don't you? The answer probably is you don't, but you could and should. Um, dementia is more likely, again, in our HIV patients going to be a manifestation of their general aging, but a large percentage of dementias in the U.S. are vascular in nature or Alzheimer's based in nature. And even Alzheimer's dementia is thought to have some degree of a vascular disease component. For the reasons we just mentioned related to cardiovascular disease, HIV patients are also more at risk for vascular related dementias. To screen for dementia, the best tool that has been standardized is one called the MOCA or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, I have a whole video of watching someone do the MOCA for like 12 minutes. It's very entertaining, but it's not part of this lecture. Um, if you screen someone with the MOCA and find a score of about 25 or less, it is at least indicative of cognitive impairment, and they probably should be referred for formal neurocognitive assessment. Among the treatments for dementia are treatments that target Alzheimer's dementia, as well as other types of dementia. Is it important to try to get a clarification of the type of dementia your patient's suffering from? Sure, because that's going to inform your therapy. Um, what types of dementia do you guys know about? Vascular. Vascular dementia, so usually a stepwise decline. Alzheimer's dementia. Frontal frontotemporal dementia, mm -hmm. and Lewy body dementia. Um, anything about Lewy body dementia that is important to remember? Hallucinations. Hallucinations, right. So Lewy body dementia, and this is just a fun extra purely geriatric fact for you. Lewy body dementia is more likely to present with hallucinations. Um, what is the best way to treat those hallucinations? So what do you guys think of hallucinations? They're like a schizo type thing. So you want kind of psychotic. So, so you want to treat it with antipsychotics, right? No. So in Lewy body dementia, antipsychotics will make the dementia worse. A secret about the hallucinations in Lewy body dementia is the patient doesn't care about them. They're perfectly happy having those hallucinations. They do not trouble the patient. And so if you have cognitive impairment, onset of hallucinations, and the hallucinations are not causing trouble to the patient, you probably don't want to give them antipsychotics, which could exacerbate that disease. If you do, first-generation antipsychotics are a little safer than novel, newer antipsychotics. Can people have dementia for other reasons? Do any of them fall into our wheelhouse? Which one? Syphilis. So, syphilis, yeah. So when people get dementia workups, as you guys have experienced in, if you have like nursing home referrals here from the VA, once someone gets a little like forgetful, you order a battery of tests, periodically an RPR turns up, and we do a whole like workup for neurosyphilis that makes us tired. Um, but um, but that's one of the things that we need to look for. You always want to make sure you rule out other reversible causes of dementia. So looking for B12 deficiency, 
thyroid dysfunction, et cetera. Imaging rarely helpful. Um, it can be helpful in vascular dementia sometimes if you can see obvious infarct areas. And sometimes you'll see uh, spongiform changes if your patient has creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is very frequently seen in our older HIV population. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times Uja and I write creutzfeldt jakob disease <laughs> on an assessment. Uh, so we've talked about bone problems. Osteoporosis is a big thing that you probably will be the chief person managing for your HIV patients because their risk for osteoporosis occurs earlier than the general population, and we tend to have to screen for them. What is one of the reasons that our patients, what are two of the reasons our patients are at risk for osteoporosis with HIV? The medications that we need to bring. Medications, and what's the other? HIV. And their HIV. HIV. So the disease and the treatment both exacerbate osteoporosis. Um, in general, if you're trying to do bone mineral density testing for a patient, these are the patients that we consider at risk for osteoporosis. It's an interesting list and one that hopefully you learned at some point during your medicine residency or even medical school or during casual reading otherwise. Our HIV patients could have some of these other risks, but all of them have the final thing on the list, which is a risk for secondary osteoporosis because of disease itself or its medication. Look at all these causes of secondary osteoporosis. Is that, is this chart show a lot of causes? Zero causes, a lot. a lot. So all of these things can cause secondary osteoporosis. HIV AIDS is one of them. Our patients could have one or more causes of secondary osteoporosis. Here's a fun algorithm that can help you to decide who of your patients with HIV should be screened for osteoporosis. You were wrong. There is a different rule set for our HIV patients. And these come from a clinical infectious disease article for the management of bone disease in HIV about eight years old. Uh, some of the people who wrote it are now older and could I actually have neurocognitive impairment. Uh, so if you are an adult with HIV, <laughs> one of the things that you could you have that we can definitely diagnose is your chronologic age. It's not hard to do. You do the birth date and add the number of years that they've been alive. Um, if a patient has no identified risk of fragility fracture or has never had one, you use the algorithm on the right. If you're taking care of a patient who's less than 40 years old, they don't need screened for bone and mineral density abnormalities. If they are older than 50 or a postmenopausal woman, we should screen them with bone density scan or something called the FRAX tool if a DEXA scan is unavailable. If they are a man between 40 and 49, or a premenopausal woman greater than 40, we don't automatically need to do a DEXA scan, but we should use a online tool to measure their fragility fracture risk uh, level. In order to do that, we use the tool online and identify all of our HIV patients as having a risk for secondary osteoporosis. Have you guys ever used the FRAX calculator? Are you comfortable using it? Oh, no. Oh, man. So, look, this, this graphic represents fractures and age. Isn't I mean, that's good, right? Yeah, I thought that was kind of brought it all together. Right. So, I clicked on that. <laughs> Did it work? OK, so <laughs> you can get the FRAX application on your phone and pay for it and resubscribe on a yearly basis. Or you can just go to that link and use it when you need to. It's a great business model for the FRAX people. I'm not sure who came up with it, but I do the one where I just go to the web all the time. So to use the FRAX, um, 
you go to the calculation tool. You identify where you are. We are currently in North America in a country called the United States, and our patients can have different ethnicities. I will say it is me. And um, I'm going to lie a little bit. Because <laughs> I'm in the, if I was an HIV patient, you're already supposed to do a DEXA scan on me. <laughs> Damn it. So, but not this guy. <laughs> so, look at that. <laughs> um, oh, oh, man. And it's European. So, the that's the year. See how um, old people can't remember. <laughs> All right, so the important thing here for our HIV patients, you click that they have secondary osteoporosis risk. You can say that this person's male. You can give them a weight in kilograms. Let's say 60. Um, you can give them a height in centimeters. I think that's low, 60 kilograms. It's, it's, it's very low. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about our hypothetical HIV. What is this? Uh, what is going on here? Okay, that's good. Um, let's say they've not had a previous fracture. They haven't had a parent with a fractured hip. Let's make them a smoker. Now, there's a part here that says select bone mineral density. Do you, how do we do that if we haven't gotten a DEXA scan? Did we just make one up? We just don't need to do it. So the tool will work with or without a bone mineral density data. So if you're using this tool in a patient without a DEXA, you just put their risks in. And if you do, it will tell you their risk of a major osteoporotic fracture at 10 years. And in order to decide whether this patient needs either osteoporosis treatment or a DEXA scan, you can use that osteoporotic fracture risk for that assessment. In general, if someone has greater than a 10% risk of a fracture by this tool, you should screen them with a DEXA scan. If their risk is higher than that, the FRAX may even indicate that they would need treatment even regardless of a DEXA scan result. So does that make sense to you? What's your threshold for diagnosing osteoporosis? Um, as if you did a DEXA scan. Yeah, so we use the T score. Is there something called a Z score? Do we use the Z score? Now we always use the T score. They always provide both scores. The T-score is your fracture risk compared to who? The same age. What's the Z-score? Yeah, you, you all have it wrong. The Z-score is age match. The T-score is compared to a average old lady. So, you want to not have the risk of fracture of a 65 year old woman because that is a big risk for fracture. Um, when we scan someone either with a DEXA scan or using the FRAX tool, another question we have is when do we do it again? Once they've fallen into these categories, do we measure it every year? Do we measure it every six months? Do we measure it every 20 years? Okay. All right, so the answer, the consensus I received was some frequency. Uh, the reason that we can determine how frequently we need to scan people is we know based on their T scores, the likelihood of people progressing either to osteopenia or osteoporosis over time. Um, for someone with a very low T score, they're still probably about eight years away from even developing osteopenia. Um, the same would be true for someone transitioning from osteopenia to osteoporosis. So this algorithm is helpful in telling you when do I need to do another assessment? If they have a low FRAX score, 
you can just do another FRAC score until they move into a different category of screen. If you did a DEXA scan, but they didn't require treatment, if they were a high risk patient with a T score below one, you rescreen them in about a year or two. If their T score was one to um, almost two, you can wait almost five years. And then if you treated them because they had osteoporosis, you assess them about every two years. And then based on the way we use treatment for osteoporosis at about the five year mark, you decide whether to continue therapy or not. Are there any risks of long term therapy with um, osteoporosis? Yes. Right. So among the theoretical risks for um, bisphosphonate therapy, people can get osteonecrosis of the jaw. They can get other site fragility fractures because the bisphosphonates incorporate into the bony matrix in a different way. So once you're treating people for a long time, considerations of changing the modality of therapy occur. And that's super exciting. As we said over and over again, um, we expect life expectancy for our HIV patients to be very similar to age match cohorts. Um, there was a large cohort study from 2000 through 2007 that said that if a patient was age 20 at that time and diagnosed and put on antiretroviral therapy, they would be expected to live at least into their early 70s. Um, life expectancy in the US now is about the late 70s, so we're at a pretty similar age match. Um, as we said, we expect the number of people with HIV to continue to increase. And um, what we've also found now is the age where people die the most with HIV is when they are young or when they are old. Old. So that's bad news if you're old because it means when you're old, you're more likely to die. However, as a positive counterpoint, it means you didn't already die. <laughs> so when you look at total deaths with HIV, one interpretation of this graph is, oh my God, we have an epidemic of death in the elderly <laughs> with HIV. But the truth of this is these red bars have shifted from mid-aged death to death at the same time that everyone else without HIV is dying. So this is actually a optimistic graph about people dying. So in summary, about half the patients you're gonna see now are what we call old. Older people have a bunch of other stuff going on that you have to manage. Treat them the same way you would your other HIV patients. Remember that their immune response is weaker, so if you can diagnose and treat them earlier, all the better. And once you treat more and more patients who are older with HIV, more of your time will be spent managing their comorbid conditions than will be spent managing the HIV itself. How many times have you switched your patient's Victarvi to non-Victarvi? Yeah. Not too often. Right. How often have you said they have this other thing going on? More often. How often have I helped you manage that? The answer is <laughs> See, question. see, that answer is actually. Uh, what do you mean helping? Um, so, and with that, we're done.